Welcome to Tommy Solo's Famous Friends. This is where I get to chat with people who I've connected with over the years in the world of arts and entertainment. And today, as part of our The Singer series, I have with me renowned tribute singer Rod Raslak. Welcome to the show, Rod. Hi, Tommy. Thank you for the invite. Very much appreciated. Well, it is my pleasure. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, most of my guests on this show are original acts, but we have this series about singers, and you are a top-shelf singer. So, your specialty really is tributes, and I know you've paid homage to a lot of Canadian artists. Now, tell me, what got you into singing in the first place? Wow. (laughs) Honestly, Tommy, I lived, when I was about in the seventh grade, and I wanted to be a guitar player, and... A couple blocks away was um, uh, a guy named Dan Satkovich, actually, out of Thunder Bay. He was, he was a child prodigy. He just was that good. And it seemed every time I went to do these jams, these guitar players would just blow me out of the water. But I was able to hold a song. I was able to hold a tune. And I kind of, that was my spot in most of the bands. And our high school music teacher heard me sing once and really convinced me that I should go get training. And I sought it out. And... I still warm up to this date uh, with the work tape that my teacher gave me uh, with approximately, oh my, 1977. And I still warm up with it every time I perform. Cool. And so you wanted to be a guitar player, but there was too much competition. And you stood out with your voice, so you got some education on that, and away you went. And all these years later, you're still at it. So maybe tell us a brief history of you as a singer in bands. Well, you know... We had some very, when I grew up in Thunder Bay, Ontario, we had, uh, we're probably the leaders out there with Garrison and Fingertip Vision, uh, some of the cover bands that I was in. Did a lot of Street Hard, a lot of Brian Adams, a lot of April Wine, that type of thing. And it's funny, you know, if I look back, did I make a mistake, you know, not picking up and moving to Toronto or moving to Winnipeg? It was simply that Back then, as you know, everybody traveled. I mean, if you got a record deal, you went from one end of the country to the other, and you stopped and played live everywhere. And I kind of got to the point where you're sitting in Thunder Bay. Everybody came to us because, you know, there's a lot of miles between Thunder Bay and Sault Ste. Marie and North Bay, where you're from, I believe, and Toronto and then Winnipeg. So they would always be stopping. And, you know, there was a healthy club circuit, which we play good gigs, good venues of 500 seat bars and uh, things they used to call boobies back home. And I think Winnipeg, they call them socials, where you can get fundraising type of things at 800, 900 people. But it would always be the Pumps or Minglewood or, or Harlequin or somebody would come through and my band would always be able to do the opener. And we got a little spoiled at it, I guess. And we didn't jump and go to Toronto because it was just too good where we were. I played Thunder Bay many times over the years. In fact, that's where I met B.B. King at the Sleeping Giant Hotel in Thunder Bay. And that was an interesting experience for me. Um, I had no idea who he was to see him out of context. I came off stage after a rather passionate set. And he walks up and says, son, I just want to shake your hand. And he says, you're you're playing with a lot of heart and soul, and there's not a lot of young white cats out these days doing that. And I said, well, thank you very much. I'm just on my way to the bar. And uh, he says, he looks at me funny, and he says, have you ever heard of B.B. King? And I said, oh, yeah, one of the all-time greats. He said, well, thank you very much. And I went, how about this? I just about spit my teeth out, and I I do not have false teeth. But, yeah, Thunder Bay holds a lot of memories for me as well. And you're right, there's a lot of venues there that people from all over Canada and and North America would travel to play at. So I get that the move to Toronto wouldn't really make a whole lot of sense when you're in your comfort zone. What made you get serious about recording tributes? Yeah, well, uh, I did record with a guy, a friend of mine, Peter Gleason, who had, you know, sometimes you know musicians, you just get the recording bug. And we used to do originals together and there's nothing fantastic. It was a lot of fun. I was heading up to go back to Thunder Bay. I'm in Georgia now and uh, to visit my mom who was, had taken ill. So I'm getting up there quite often and a guy named Chris Knowles who plays in this Parallel 49 Canadian Tribute Act where, you know, you've seen all those songs. He recorded, never played with them before. He was a fan of our bands and I, I never really knew him that well. But he did a copy. He laid down all the guitar work and the drums with Chad Melcher out in Edmonton who's in your Canadian Country Music Hall of Honor, actually. 
And so they laid these tracks down and it was Trouble by Street Art. And everybody knows I'm a crazy Street Art fan. And uh, Joe Foley from the hip show out in Vancouver, you know, was also from Thunder Bay, suggested, hey, I think Rod is going up there. You should have him record the Street Art song for you. And I was going to do that. And that's, that's when COVID hit. And so COVID came and it was the first time we've ever did something uh, through the ether. You know, and we learned how to do it. I have a producer in a studio that I use here in Alfreda, Georgia. So all the tracks, you know, would, would head down to Andy Bone here at the Pipeline Studio. And he'd assemble it. And uh, I'd walk in and do my vocal. And we just kind of liked it. And we went through all the uh, songs that we grew up playing. Um, a lot of Street Heart, yeah, you've heard. A lot of Prism. And it's a real fun and a real challenge to record them all. I'll bet. Now, as a singer in studio, I tend to double track my lead vocals. Do you do the same? A good question. You know, I was such a traditionalist and I go back to uh, Valerie uh, Sherman. I listened, you know, to the podcast that she had with you when she was talking about dropping the tuning E flat and, and she said, no, no, I wanted an A440. Editor's note, Rod is referring to Valerie Shearman, who is in her own right another amazing top shelf singer who does a heart tribute called Just Heart and her own original stuff as well. And you can check her out on episode 98 in two parts from just a few shows back. Now back to this show. I was such a traditionalist, I never had done that. And I didn't like double tracking. But I learned that, you know, the producers know what they're doing. And I learned that I'm supposed to serve the song. It's not about me. And it's about the listener. So... When he tells me he wants me to double track on certain portions of the song, I do it. And, you know, I do my own harmonies all the time. Uh, but then uh, what the producer would do will take what I sang, my harmonies, and just try to change the texture. He'll lay it down and pull me back a little bit so it sounds more natural. So all those kind of tricks are happening in the studio. I don't call them tricks. I think they're, uh, these are talented people that, you know, I'm blessed to have these kind of engineers. And I just learned to listen and serve the song. Absolutely, because like you say, it's not about me. It's about the song and it's about the fans. And uh, we want to make sure that we release a, a viable product that everybody can enjoy. It's interesting that there are people as artists who say, well, so-and-so sold out because they've gone commercial. I don't yeah. really follow that train of thought. You know, I feel like there's a reason why they call it pop music. And if you're not interested in being popular, then that's fine. But if you want to be popular and you have it in you, that's when you learn to serve the song and serve the people. I agree with you 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah so the name Parallel 49, that's referring to the 49th latitude north of the equator. Is that something that I'm guessing yeah. it comes from your relationship between countries? That is Canada and U.S.? Yeah, absolutely. And I have a group of friends that I had there for years. We have friends, musicians, I guess I call them friends, but they're, they're excellent musicians. And when I was in Minneapolis, when I was living in Minneapolis, you know, it was, it was close enough to literally drive there, right? I mean, so I can drive and get together and our plan was, hey, when we retire, let's go do this full time and let's do a Canadian trip, something like Took. I didn't even know Took was there. And so you know, if I text with Jeff Neal or something once in a while, I'll say, hey, we're little Took, I call it, you know. And yeah, I was purposely named Parallel 49 because I was in the States and the other guys were in Canada. And I thought it was uh, an original thing. I found out it was not an original thing because when you Google Parallel 49, everything comes up, including, you know, the very popular bar down in Gastown in Vancouver. But when that band did not get off the ground and this uh, recording opportunity came up with the guys uh, Chad in Edmonton and Chris in Thunder Bay, it just seemed natural that we had the art, the logo, and we went with uh, Parallel 49. And we'll be right back after this. Makes sense to me now. It's interesting you mentioned Took because... Um, I wasn't aware of them either, and ironically, it was Holly Woods from the band Toronto, who lives in North Carolina, who brought them right. to my attention. So they've yeah. got greater notoriety in the States, apparently, than they do here in Canada. 
I don't know. Yeah, they're an amazing, amazing app. They really are. Yeah. Now, watching your live videos, I wonder, are you the musical director who takes care of the arrangements? In that act, no, Chris does that because, you know, I'm down here alone. I'm the valence electron. I mean, I'm down in America and they're all pretty well in Thunder Bay. The live band is all from Thunder Bay. So it makes sense for Chris to handle that. And basically everything, the arrangements are done. I pop in and I lay the vocal down and away we go. Cool. That is a top shelf band. Have any of the members of that band, have any of them had a record deal or anything like that? You know, honestly, we're all in the same boat. You know, we're all all the same. We've been cover players, but we're very, very serious at what we do. And that's why I'm so grateful for the invite and, and, and you recognizing that, you know, 90% of the musicians of the bands don't write. I mean, they don't. They're performers and they work equally as hard at their, their art. And everybody I've played with in that band is the same type of thing. There's a level of professionalism they they have and continue to aspire to. The current tribute I'm doing now, Tommy, down here in the States is the Deep Purple trip. And, you know, I get to do Coverdale and Ian Gillian and it, the vocal's so great. It's like playing golf, you, you know, to try to get to be a scratch golfer. And so I get to aspire to these fantastic vocalists and, and push myself to continue to train and get better. Jimmy Barnes is another newfound hero of mine, you know, from Cold Chisel, what, I recently discovered and trying to find out how he makes those sounds like he does without hurting yourself. And I think if you heard this flight tonight, we did a Nazareth song was our last cut. I surprised myself that I could do that. And, you know, I don't blow out anymore. I've learned how to make those sounds and how to get raunchy up top. And it was a long road learning to do it. And I like being able to aspire to a higher level. That'll always drive me. Well, for me personally, as a singer, for a while, I did a solo acoustic unplugged covers act, and I found that the best way for me to pull off like uh, Rod Stewart or uh, Bonnie Tyler kind of thing is just to relax my uh, my vocal cords, if if that makes any sense, you know. It absolutely. Rather than rather than like you see so many people out there, young guys especially that are just killing themselves, you know, they're turning red in the face or neck veins are sticking out, you know, and they look like they're going to have a stroke. And uh, it is possible, I suppose, to hit some of those notes by literally forcing them out, but that isn't the best way to do it. So maybe what kind of tips would you have for young young people starting out trying to expand on the range? Oh, yeah, Tommy. Uh, there's so much room. The sky's the limit, I believe, for a trained vocalist in rock and roll, because like you say, a lot of them don't. And a lot of them have come to me and, hey, will you help? And, you know, even my warm-up routines and that, they're very personal to me. And I'd have to know the person, even to share it. But I've done it for a few people. And they never do take the time. And I think you do need to train. It's all about breath. The breath's got to go down. you got to know how to place it up in the mask. I always say the lower the breath, the higher the note. And to your point, too, about relaxing, it is absolutely critical. As soon as you tighten up, you will hurt yourself. Or I can do this now. You know, I can go to rehearse for hours every night and, and do the Ian Gillian and do the Nazareth and that type of stuff. And uh, you get a little fatigued, but you won't blow out. So it's all about breath. And if I don't mind giving a plug, Tony, the, the one teacher, not every teacher is going to be good for you, but there's one in Germany that's free a lot of it on the internet called Freya Casey. Freya Casey is uh, somebody I follow a bit and I think she's real smart. It's all about breath and moving the breath and placing it up in the resonators and projecting in that, you know, all those type of fundamentals. Now you mentioned the mask, if I'm not mistaken. That's interesting because when I was a young guy in a band out of Toronto, at one point I ran into some trouble with my voice and I ended up taking voice lessons from a woman named Rosemary Burns. And that was her thing, was the mask. Uh, I never yeah. really, I never really wrapped my head around that so much. But what I really did get out of taking lessons was that you have to look after yourself. You know, that you have to yeah. make sure that you take care of your diet, uh, proper nutrition and, and your physical state. You know, make sure that you're in half decent shape and you get proper rest as well, which for a young guy on the road in a rock and roll band... <laughs> yeah. yeah, it has its challenges, but, um, you know, I, I'm always grateful. I think 
maybe, you know, God told me to be a singer because I could have been a train wreck if I was a guitar player, I think, because I was always taking care of the voice. You remember when we were in the early 80s and when you're touring and you'd wake up, Tommy, remember you'd go, you see if you can make a falsetto sound, you know, and if I can make a falsetto sound, I go, okay, I'll be all right by 9 p.m. And you, you kind of work it in all day. Editor's note, although we've certainly come a long way since the 1980s, back then, pretty well every bar, lounge, nightclub that a singer could work in was filled with people smoking tobacco. And breathing in all that smoke while you're trying to sing can definitely cause a singer to lose his or her voice. Now back to the show. Now the difference is what people don't understand is you're not singing enough. You know, you get two, three gigs a month and people go weeks without singing. And I can tell uh, when I go see somebody that this guy, he's not warming up. He's not keeping up on it. And you struggle, but in a different way. But to your point about the mask, you know, it's funny you you say that. And and I've done a tribute to Brian Adams too when I was in uh, Minneapolis. And I tell people, you know, I'd rather sing Getty Lee than Brian Adams. You know, because Brian Adams is like you say, Rod Stewart, he blows so much air through his throat. It's just the way he sings and has that, you know, that patented sound that he gets. But for somebody trying to copy it, it's a lot of work. Where Getty, you can, you know, you take in a breath and you can get up into the mask and it's it's thinner, it's higher. And it's not as much work as somebody like a Rod Stewart or um, Brian Adams. Well, I think the thing is now, as a songwriter, I have an advantage because I'm writing in my natural range, okay? Right. And I've, I've said many times on this show and face-to-face with people that while I'm not so much uh, a note-for-note guy and I'm not, I'm not a cover guy really anymore, uh, I've recorded a few covers, but I put my own personal stamp on those, I do appreciate how much time and effort it takes to put up a top-notch tribute. You know, I mean, yeah. if you're going to be, for example, a PRISM tribute act, then you better sound like Ron Tabak. If you're going to do a proper Guess Who tribute, you better sound like Burton Cummings. And that ain't easy. So really, my hat is off to people like you who can do it. And we talk about the technique and the warm-ups, and I can't stress enough for anybody out there, regardless of your technique, warm-ups are very important to a singer. Do you do anything else to look after your voice, Rod? And we'll be right back after this. Voice is a hard thing to rehearse, in my opinion. When I do it, I go out in my car and I have lots of staccato and I'll go through my warm up, which is about 30 minutes. And if I have enough time going far enough, uh, you know, a few times a week, especially if I'm not recording or rehearsing that week, pushing yourself out to do it is really important. And I'll do it half voice, full voice and octaves. And that's the way I'll prepare myself. And, you know, we talk about the warm up, but the cool down is also important. You know, just to never shut it off and just, I used to hum for, you know, 30, 40 minutes to put it back to sleep and it it seems to make it easier to wake up the next day, wake the cords up the next day. So uh, that's what I do. And a lot of focus on the breath talk. Absolutely. And I know that there are people who find other ways to get, like there are, there are things you can buy, for example, throat sprays, like even Jonathan Kane, the longstanding keyboardist from Journey. And he actually used to coach Ariel Pineda, Steve Perry's replacement as lead singer in Journey. And those guys were using all kinds of sprays and different things before the show. Wow. I think that a better way is to, as you say, do your proper warm-ups. And yeah, cool downs are also a really good idea. I know I used to do the same thing when I was on the road full-time. I'd be humming on my way uh, after the gig. You know, and that's, mm-hmm. that's super important. And hydrating yourself. You know, making Incredible. sure, like I, I don't drink a lot on stage, but I think it's important to make sure that your vessel is lubricated on a regular basis. You sound exactly like Mary Witcher or Mary McGee, my, my teacher of decades. I said, you're too late if you're drinking it on stage, right? but you've got to drink it all morning and you got to drink it the next day. 
And it's absolutely critical to be able to, uh, you know, produce a good sound. Yeah, you know, the new thing I'm trying right now, Tommy, you could tell me, is I just ordered one of these. It's an apparatus that looks like a big kazoo, I guess. And you can dial it in and you breathe out and breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, and it gives resistance. So I'm giving that a try now and anything, you know, look for an edge to try to build up the strength and, you know, let's get good ratings, but I'll, I'll keep you posted and see how that does. It's sort of like uh, resistance training for the breath. Cool. It's like lifting weights with your breath. Only not. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Try doing curls with your tongue. See how that works out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that's another thing too, is that I've always believed in being in pretty good physical shape and I was an avid martial artist for the first, oh God, 50 years of my life pretty much. But as a singer, you don't want to get too carried away with lifting weights either because that does things to your neck. Sure. Well, you know, you brought that up a couple of times now about the strain and I tell you, um, about a year and a half ago, I was having trouble just randomly where, you know, I would tighten up and come on, I know how to do that. And my teacher always said, Rod, just have the baby. Just have the baby. You know what to do. Stay relaxed and have the baby. And I was doing that and still running into trouble. But I found out that, you know, at our age, after many years of beating yourself up on the hockey rink for something, that I had a triple fusion done in my throat. So they go in through your vocal cords and they, they fuse those vertebrae together. And since that is done in the recovery, first I thought I'd never sing again. That's when you first come out. But when you recovered after a few months, I'm not having that anymore. So it's exactly what you're saying. There was something up there where I was getting strain, you know, in the top of the shoulders and around the neck. And it would rear its head at the most inopportune time. So I think you're 100% correct in that overtraining or something like that, too. You don't want to have tightness around there. You just don't. No. Especially if you're singing prison. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no kidding. You know, it's interesting. I also spoke to Henry Small on this show a couple of times. And the difference between Henry Small and Ron Tabak really, I think, is technique because Henry is a very clean singer, whereas Ron was was one of those guys that pushed a lot of air through his throat, you know. Um, and that, you talk about being a tribute act. I said to Henry at the time, you're damned if you do or damned if you don't because Canadian fans really never took to Henry as the singer from Prism. But that aside, I know you've got different things going on and you've sent me several tribute videos. There's something new that you're doing right now. Why don't you tell us about that? Yeah, down here, and I tell you, the Atlanta area, I had a really hard time. Uh, it, there, it seemed up north, maybe because I grew up in Thunder Bay, and, and whenever I put a band together, it was always the best musicians. I pick up the phone and away we go. And in Minneapolis, it was a little tougher but I always seemed to get a group together. And as I came down south, it was really clicky. You know, I found myself auditioning in, in bands that wasn't playing them actually to my standard. My friend Derek Ferrota and the Sugarmans, he's played guitar with Chuck Berry and Amy Grant he's toured with. And he's a real professional. And he was giving me guitar lessons and heard me sing. And then we did a duo. So we did the acoustic duo like you're talking about. We go out and do. And we do Three Dog Night and, and, and we do a bunch of old uh, 70s type of thing called the Sugarmans because the Burke Sugarmans made that special. That's what we, we tagged it off of. And, you know, he introduced me to more people. And I finally found some guys here that are all have a passion for Deep Purple. And uh, we're about 18 songs into it right now. And I'm just having a blast. It is so fun to sing Ian Gillian and uh, Coverdale. And, you know, you're talking a band that just 17 albums and they've had 14 different players but it's amazing uh music and i i hope it's the right tribute i think we're going to kick uh, a brian adams one before that just in case you know because we're going to have the 70s rock and roll heads at one and the ladies do like the dance to brian adams so those are the two trips i'm working on right now down here in the south cool so are there plans for any live shows summer festival performances anything like that coming up soon Oh, you know, we are so, by the time this came together, we were a little late for this year's festival season, and it's tough, I gotta tell you, because we're really chomping at the bit to get out there. And, you know, the bookings are mostly done, but we do have a longer season down here in Georgia, so these festivals can run into September and October as well. So we're hoping we get the second phase of it, and right now we're looking at opening, you know, we'll go and open if it's a high-level club, 
I mean, they have clubs here now that only do tributes and they do very well. And they're, they're very high end clubs where you're recorded and it goes out on the internet and, and all those type of things. So we're hoping to get an, an opener there in the next uh, few weeks. You know, some other friends of friends said, hey, let us open. You don't have to pay us. You know, that never changes, right? And we'll go up and be able to get some good footage and an opportunity for some good promo. So that's what we're doing now. And hopefully be ready for the, uh, the second half of the festival season and be full bore next year. Is there any place that people can go, like a site or a page that people can go to see where you're going to be performing at? Not quite yet, because these two acts have not gone out and promoted them yet, and that'll happen in the next four or five weeks. I appreciate that, Tommy. And if I could send you that information when that is up, I'd love if you give us a plug and a little bit of the future. The music, though, that you know, we talked about earlier, the Canadian classics and the couple Montreal songs, uh, that can be found at Parallel 49 on, on any of the uh, music platforms. Uh, I usually go to YouTube. Sometimes you put a dash topic, Parallel 49 dash topic, it pops up. There's a few different Parallel 49 things that you can imagine. There's like the bars and a few things named like that, but they usually group up and they all line up. I should say, you know, if you listen to the Harlequin song, we had Glenn Willows actually played that solo on there. You know, he did that for us. And Mark Gladstone from Prism did the uh, keys on our version of Flying by Prism. So it's really amazing and we feel honored that they would do that. They felt good enough about the quality we were putting out that they accepted and joined and joined in. I got a message just out of nowhere from Gino Scarpelli two weeks ago. <laughs> he, he heard the Nazareth song and just said, wow, you're talented. And coming from Gino and Gatto, that was a big deal for me. Never met him, but it's nice for him to reach out. And of course, Mitch Elfield, who he is so supportive. He's just a class guy. And, and we did the pack, which is actually Jimmy Larson wrote that song. But Mitch was right behind it, and he supports us in every single thing we put out. Mitch is a friend of mine. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah, yeah well, listen, I know that people can find you on Facebook, and you're posting what's happening there. I know you don't have all day. You're a busy guy. But I do want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to do this with me, Rod. And until next time, cheers. Thank you, Tommy. Take care. Rod Raslak, what a nice guy. I'll tell you, Rod approached me about the idea of featuring tribute acts on this show, and I wasn't sure if that was something I wanted to do because I've been focusing on original acts. But I'll tell you, when you hear Rod sing, and when you hear what his guys and gals have done with their tribute, you'll understand why he's featured on the singers here. Now, for your listening pleasure, here is Rod Raslak and Parallel 49 with their licensed cover of the Nazareth hit, This Flight Tonight. Enjoy. Sailors, you got the Dutch 
Tommy Solo's Famous Friends is a one-man production, meaning that I've done all the work, including recording, editing, guest acquisition, etc. The theme song for Tommy Solo's Famous Friends is a clip from my original composition, The Burn. All rights reserved. And hey, if you like the show, why not help us out, buy me a coffee, subscribe, hit the like button, and until next time, cheers.